Hi, my name is Zhang. Hi, and Hi, I'm gonna teach you guys about the science in World War One. And um, when I was doing this research, I think uh, one of the biggest things that I figured out about World War One is that um, it's like one of the, the big turning points of any type of war that happened previously because of how much technology was advancing and how much new stuff was coming out. And so it was that point where, uh, yeah, after the machine gun was invented, war changed into this perspective of, oh, you know, we're going out for the glory of our, to, to defend our country and, and blah, 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 to, yeah, we're just gonna start massacring people uh, to the millions. And that really changed how we saw war um, as well. Our perspective of war kind of changed as well with that. And so, you know, before that, it would be like an honorable thing to go out to war on your horseback and ride into war with, with all your comrades. It would be a glorious thing, but um, now it's more as in like, it's a terrible thing where it shouldn't happen. Uh, some of the things that were used the most common in the war, and of course, you can't take out the machine guns that were used. And, and yeah, like it says here, machine guns were the weapon that signified World War I. It was used on both sides um, all the time. And it was one of the most used uh, heavy type of um, arm type of weapon, I guess, that was used. And uh, despite what it looks like and what it can do, it was actually used to defend trenches, not for attacking, just because of how heavy it is. This, this one part right here is said to be 40 pounds. And the reason why it, it, it's so heavy is because it has a water tank right here that pulls the, the gun down as you're shooting. And so uh, it can fire a couple of thousand rounds in a minute, I've heard. But that's, it's, it varies because it can, parts get broken all the time and yeah. And yeah, and because of this, um, trenches were built and so, since uh, people are shooting at you directly at multiple thousands of rounds per minute, people started to dig underground. And so it was like a really simple way of getting um, away with that. But it kind of became like a stale, stalemate, stale, yeah. where you can't really <coughs> advance or retreat. And so, yeah. And so I think machine guns are, you know, trench, trench warfare is like a, thing in World War One, and I think it's because of these machine guns that are uh, the reason why uh, those kind of things go about. And this one's called the Maxima um, uh, MG08. Yeah. And these were, yeah, these were used everywhere. Like th this is the the thing that they used all the time. And yeah, these were on tanks, on planes. Yeah, you could find them everywhere. And it's what, this, this is like the, the go-to that they did. And the one that was used the most next was the Lewis machine gun, where this one was portable. So what people would do is, um, whenever you, you're overtaking a trench, people really, people really don't think about how they're gonna defend it after they overtake it, because that's like the most important part of overtaking a trench is to defend it when they're coming back for a counterattack. And so the Lewis machine gun was a was really good for that because they can it was portable and so whenever they will overtake a trench they'll bring the, the machine gun over and then use it as a as to defend a counterattack that will come. And so yeah and these are the two types of machine guns that were used the most. <laughs> Next the tanks and airplanes and so this one's called the Mark I, and this is the very first tank that was used in, in battle, like officially used in battle. And it's, it looks really weird to me. <laughs> There's a wheel on the back. <laughs> and yeah, and th this thing weighed a lot, and the fastest it can go was uh, 15 miles per hour, I think. And so people can run faster than it. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. and. Um, I was looking at a video and I think a historian said soldiers uh, that went into war, World War I, went into horseback 
and came out with tanks and, and airplanes, and I think it was a really good quote, and so I wrote it in there, and yeah, I think it really signifies World War One. And yeah, as of World War One, uh, tanks weren't really used that much. These kind of really early prototype tanks were introduced at the very end of the war, and so and like I said, it was very slow, very heavy. They didn't, they couldn't carry a lot of ammo or machine guns in it, and so it wasn't used that much, but. Since it gets so much more important in World War II, I thought it'd be good to put it in and tell you guys it's it's significant. Oh, actually, it's nine miles per hour, not fifteen miles. I think fifteen was in kilometers. So, yeah. Yes, and planes, planes, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got a lot of. Yeah. So planes were used. Um, a lot in, in the war as well, and um, at first, um, the very first prototype of planes had propellers at, on the back, and um, these type of planes were used as scouters, so they wouldn't be used as to go in and like, sh like rain down fire on enemy, and it was just to go out and to observe where people were, just to look around where they were, and scout out the area and they'll put in cameras on the back of the planes and they'll take pictures of the landscape and that's usually how they they observe and did their scouting um, thing um, but as time went on they began to develop it more and like i said they started mounting in machine guns which were easy because they don't they didn't really have to worry about cooling it down because of all the air that's going around it and so it's a natural cooling system that they have with the airplanes. And so they really like putting machine guns on planes so they can shoot. But the thing is, whenever they put machine guns on your plane, you get the trouble of shooting down your own plane, and that's not good. And so what they started doing is they started to mount it in front of the plane, on the nose of the plane, and so that there's no way that you can shoot your own plane. And <laughs> like as you're steering, you can you could aim as you're steering. So the way that you're facing is the way that you're aiming, and it was really easy to do. And they needed to make a bunch of planes, and they needed people to fly these planes. And so they had to make it as easy as it, they can learn it. They needed to make it as easy, and, and so people can learn it fast and go out there and fight. And so yeah, that's why they started putting machine guns on the nose of the airplane. But the thing is, as planes evolved, they started putting the propellers in the front of the plane because um, this is more like a push that they had. So they will push air from the back and it will push the plane up. But this was more like a pull. And they'll pull the air and that's how the, air, the airplane would fly. And that was a much more efficient way of flying. But the thing is, if you have a nose right here and a propeller that's going around it, it's gonna shoot down the propeller. And so what they did was they uh, started to make um, really strong propellers that can deflect the bullets. But <laughs> the very first prototype that they made, um, the flyer went out. He, I think he got like four confirmed kills and then he got shot down. And then it landed on Germany uh, territory. And then the Germans took it, took the idea. And they started making synchronized uh, machine guns and propellers and so that gap that the two propeller wings will have they'll shoot and so they made it synchronized and yeah it gave them the idea of doing that which was really interesting if you think yeah because I don't understand how people could just you know see a plane that's down and, and be like oh we can use that and then make it better but apparently the Germans did and so yeah and one of the most uh, one of the most famous uh, weapons that they use in World War One is chemical warfare. But um, if you really look at the whole war and how many people died in the whole war, uh, chemical warfare didn't kill that many people. It killed a lot of people, but if you look at the whole scale of the war, it really didn't do that much. But the reason why it, like you guys all know about it is because of the effects that it left on on the
the soldiers because it wouldn't be like an insta kill. Even chlorine gas wouldn't be like you have to breathe in a lot of chlorine to die. And so what people will do is they'll find people in the battlefield that are that are dying and they'll bring it in, they'll bring them in and they'll be dying and they'll stay with their families for weeks. And that leaves an impact to the family and to the people around uh, them. And to just see them slowly die is gonna leave a big imprint. And I think that's why people remember chemical warfare uh, for a very long time. And yeah. After, actually, before World War I happened, they had a little, uh, uh, like a organization where they said like, let's not use chemical stuff that can kill people. But there were a lot of stuff that people found loopholes around it. And so, contrary to many belief, uh, it wasn't the Germans that started using, the first started using the, using chemical warfare, it was actually the French. And they started using uh, tear gas, tear gas at first. And so they used tear gas, I think, in, in the early, or in the middle of the war, I think they did, started using it. And then Germany picked up on it. And then they were like, let's make something more deadlier than tear gas. And that's when they came up with the chlorine gas, which if you breathe it in, it will start drowning, it'll put water on your lungs. And so you're literally drowning from the inside out. And so that was not good, yeah. And whenever they first deployed it, um, I think they had a whole regiment that was prepared to fend off the Germans. And uh, they saw the cloud, they saw the yellow cloud come in and they were like, hey, I think they're coming. So because they didn't know at first what it was. And so, hey, I think they're attacking. And so they rounded up all the troops in the front line to prepare what, what was coming. And yeah, that did not end good. But the funny thing about that is um, you see, you, you know, you see your enemies fall. What are you gonna do? You're gonna go attack, right? But the Germans couldn't attack because they were also getting affected by the chlorine glass. And so even the Germans who developed it didn't really see, didn't, couldn't really tell the, the, the deadliness of the gas. And so it was, a, it, was, it was casualties from both sides. And later on they developed uh, more gas like phosgene gas and mustard gas. And mustard gas is, yeah, that I was, I was reading that and I was very surprised at what mustard gas was because it countered the, the gas mask that they uh, started to develop as they had more and more chemical warfare. They put on masks and so what they developed was um, as long as the gas touches you um, in the skin, it'll leave like marks and it'll swell up and it'll leave horrible marks on your body and it was painful, obviously. And so you couldn't deal with it you need to be covered with head to toe. And that's very hard when you're fighting in the middle of nowhere. And so mustard gas was very, very deadly at that time. And I think that's it.